Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, my name is Pastor Joanne, and it's great to be with you today. The title of the sermon is Riding on the Back of a Donkey. And the Old Testament scripture today is going to be taken out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Listen for God's word. When they had come near... Jerusalem and had reached Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. God's word for us today. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O God, who is our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes it's important to think about life from a different perspective. There's a wonderful poem by Mary Oliver entitled, The Poet Thinks of the Donkey. And this poem will stretch us today to do just that to listen for a different perspective than what we're thinking we might hear on Palm Sunday. The poem goes like this. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited, not especially brave or filled with understanding. He stood and waited. Now horses turned out into the meadow, leap with delight. How doves released from their cages clatter away, splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree, as usual, waited. Then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he at all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been, a donkey. Small, dark, obedient. I hope finally the donkey felt brave. I hope finally he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped, as he had to, forward. Mary Oliver's poem today for us to think about. In Jungian dream analysis, when you want to understand your dreams, you have to be all the different parts. For instance, if you want to understand what your dream really means in, in your dream, you are the different parts of your dream. The beach, the person, the vase, the waves, the ocean, the rock, the sun. Every different part of your dream, you are, and they are you. So you say as the sun, in order to understand your dream, I am warm and I am shining on the beach. Or as the ocean, you say, I'm powerful and I am crashing on the sand. Or as a rock, you might say, I am heavy and I can crush those around me. Because all parts of the dream are you. And if you want to truly understand a dream, you have to understand the various parts and perspectives of each piece. Well, I found myself this week trying to imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And the more I thought about it, the more I wondered about the donkey. You might say, yikes, 
Why care so much about a donkey? He's only an animal, a means to an end to get Jesus into town. But as I read Mary Oliver's poem, it started me thinking, what can we learn about Jesus, about self and about others from a new perspective? As I was contemplating Palm Sunday this week, I've been trying to put myself in the story. I've been wondering what life would have been like during those dusty days on the road into Jerusalem, riding on the back of this donkey. Imagine for a moment the setting for Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem that day. He had spent the last three years of his life teaching on the kingdom of God. And Jesus told people on those dusty roads about the character and nature of God and how they could change and how their life could be different. He told them to imagine perspectives other than their own. And Jesus got people to think about forgiveness in new ways, turning their back on the woman who was caught in the act of adultery by considering their own sin. He said, those who are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Jesus taught followers to imagine miracles, to believe people could be healed. He took what didn't seem to be enough, like the fishes and loaves, and made it more. Jesus got people to imagine a world where if sharing and thinking about others was a perspective, the whole world would be better. It would be community. And Jesus got ordinary people like you and me to think outside the box and imagine perspectives other than their own. In the passage or pericope right before our text in Matthew, it says that a large crowd followed Jesus as he left Jericho, going up to Jerusalem. And the crowd watched as two blind men shouted at Jesus and asked him to give them their sight. Jesus imagines what life might be like blind and heals them by putting his hand over their eyes. Jesus did this by touching their eyes. This act was extraordinary, earthy, and imaginative. It was extraordinary because it was a miracle. It was earthy because he connected blindness with God and his own hands. And it was imaginative because in order to do a miracle or even, even contemplate it, you have to put yourself in another person's perspective. You have to imagine what they are going through. Jesus had to feel or imagine what it was like for the man to be blind. Some history here. The gospel writers, including Matthew, wanted readers to know that as Jesus entered the city on the donkey that day, that he truly was the rightful king of Israel. The first century Jews would have remembered 900 years before, as written in 1 Kings, how King Solomon, as the newly anointed king of Israel by his father, King David, rode a donkey with a royal procession. The people that day would have also remembered the prophecy in Zechariah, as quoted by Matthew, that the king comes riding on a donkey. That's what made everyone so excited that day. The city was crowded with pilgrims getting ready for Passover. They were ready for some change, some celebration, some understanding about what is important in life. As the cloaks and palm branches were spread to cover the road, the people were preparing for a king. They were preparing to be changed. They were honoring the one who had taught them so much. And they were preparing for life to be different because of this itinerant preacher and teacher. Some might have wanted a stallion or a war horse, but the donkey is not that. The donkey is a humble animal. The use of a donkey would have meant the king came in peace. The shouts of Hosanna to the son of David were echoes from Psalm 118. Hosanna was a popular shout meaning save us. And the crowd had placed their hope and trust in Jesus, giving him the title son of David, a messianic designation. The people were proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah at least in their minds, Jesus would be their political savior. After all, if he was a popular figure, a great teacher, 
and one who had miraculous power, maybe he really was the long-awaited savior for the Jewish nation. Maybe he really would deliver them from Roman oppression, which they were absolutely used to. Of course, that day that he entered Jerusalem, Jesus knew what was about to happen. First the cheering and then the fanfare. Jesus probably saw in the crowd's faces what they wanted from him. He saw what they needed. He probably put himself in their shoes. He probably could tell that their hopes were placed at his feet. How could he not be overwhelmed at all those expectations on him? How could he not feel responsible? He saw the palm branches being thrown down for him. He saw their hopes for a king. But he knew later that things would change. Life would not stay in the fanfare. Life would not stay in the hopes. There would be disappointment and betrayal, his trial, his painful suffering, and the ultimately his death just a few days later. Jesus knew as he imagined the future that he would not be the kind of king that the crowds were looking for that day. We know how this Easter week, written in all four of the gospel, closes. We know Jesus' closest disciples did not recognize that he was about to be taken away to die after the Passover meal in the upper room. We know that one of his band of men would betray him, Judas, and another, Peter, would deny him. We know that Jesus is crucified on the cross. And we also know the results of that death that God raised him from death to life and changed the course of human history. We know that Jesus' death was the ultimate sacrifice for sin and separation from God, and we know that by this, his kingdom would grow and flourish to the ends of the earth. It is a kingdom that you and I, as followers of Christ, belong to. It is the kingdom that Jesus has established as the church, us, It includes all of us who seek each and every day to follow Jesus as our king, riding on the back of a humble donkey. Jesus riding on a humble animal, not worried about how he would appear, not worried about people's expectations of him, but doing what he was called to do, bringing hope to a hurting world, one miracle at a time, one encounter at a time, one gesture at a time. Jesus putting himself in our shoes, wondering about life from our perspective. I have a story to share with you about Iraq. I remember the day the water ran out in March of 2005. The trucks carrying the water from one base to another got sabotaged, taken over, and stolen. The morning water delivery never made it to our FOB forward operating base. The morning meal could not be served. The troops and soldiers had nothing to put in their canteens. Some people had a little leftover from the night before, but showers had to be halted. No one could brush their teeth. A loud message came across the loudspeaker, quote, our water supply has been sabotaged. Only use water for drinking. We are working on the problem, but you might have to go a whole day with the water you have. Well, some soldiers had left over and some had none. The grumbling started. Meals in bags were handed out for a lunch. It was difficult, though, to make your concentrated lunch without water. If you had leftover, you could do it. If you didn't, you went hungry. People did not start panicking until the evening when dinner was served in a bag and you again needed water to stir in your beef casserole in order to make your dinner. We were always told in Iraq in that 130 degree heat, which it was that day, that to drink an eight ounce bottle of water each hour in order to keep hydrated. Well, activity was rationed to indoors and water was being asked to be shared. Soon people started to be angry at the logistics people by saying, didn't that logistics company protect our water? What's the matter with them? Why didn't they do what their job was and secure our water properly? Didn't they fire on the enemy who stole our water? How did our enemy get hold of the water anyway? 
These were the questions that came. They kept asking, why do they allow this to happen? We could die out here with no water. People were certainly not putting themselves in the shoes of the logistics people. Instead, they were blaming them for their suffering, calling them names and small riots of anger were rising. Our base, forward operating base Spiker, was made up of 8,300 soldiers all rationing water. Commanders were demanding units to come with all the water they had and it was being shared between soldiers who had none. But as human nature would dictate, some were hiding the water, some were not sharing, some were hoarding water under their pillows. It was pretty awful. The commander asked me as the head division support command chaplain on that base to make an announcement, to say something that would make the people share. He asked for a quote, I have a dream speech. Well, I was thirsty too, and I was scared too, and I didn't want to die in the desert with my two boys, nine and 10 years old back in the States. And honestly, I didn't feel particularly up to an I have a dream speech that the commander was asking for. I felt pressured, but of course agreed to it just in case God might want to use me, which I was kind of doubting at that point, to be honest. So for two hours I prayed and two hours on the base I said the following on the loudspeaker. Hello everyone, this is Chaplain Joanne Martindale and I'm the Division Support Command Chaplain and I want to say a few words to you today. I, like many of you, have family to get home to. I have a nine-year-old boy, Ryan, and a 10-year-old boy, Quinn, who want me to return home. We have children and mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and partners and spouses, and we have people who care about us back home. We may have to go several days without a water truck. People are working frantically to get water here from the other bases. Plans have been put into action, but we also have to change our behavior. We have to work together. We can't hoard or steal or people will die. We're all familiar with the Army mission. Heck, we wouldn't be in Iraq without a mission. Well, now the mission has changed. Today, we are not on a mission for the Iraqi people. We are on a mission for us. We need to monitor our battle buddies. We need to monitor our water intake and we need to work together. We have people in the cache, the Combat Army Surgical Hospital, who have fallen out because of dehydration. The hospital is out of water and we need to pull our resources. If it was your child or spouse in the hospital, what would you do? Are you able to put yourself in their place? In combat, we have each other's back. No soldier left behind. We've heard that before in the Army. But today, we need to hydrate each other. Our lives depend on it. Friends, please bring the water, the camel packs, the Gatorades, whatever you have to the hospital, so we can surround our fellow soldiers with life. Friends, walk and drive and carry each other to the hospital. If you see a fellow soldier walking, help them. If you see someone thirsty, give them a drink. If you see someone angry, walk alongside them. Friends, we will meet at the cache in one hour, all of us. Go get your water, go get your Gatorades, go bring your supplies to the hospital. Our mission has changed. In one hour, much to my surprise, there was a parade of soldiers carrying camel packs, packs filled with water, canteens, water bottles, Gatorades, care packages, candy. I brought the communion wine, of course. It was a parade of soldiers putting others first. Everyone arrived at the hospital and put their stuff in the room. Within two hours, the room was packed with enough liquid to carry the camp through another two days of no water. The troops visited the sick soldiers, gave high fives, encouragement, and candy. Soldiers were helping soldiers to sip water slowly. They were checking on each other. They did it. They shared. They changed the mission. They cared for each other. 
I will never for as long as I live forget the way the base came together, all 8,332, to help each other on that day. Friends, I don't really get shocked easily, but that day I was shocked. It's funny how we rarely expect for God to use us, but we need a paradigm shift. Friends, God does use us when we least expect it and we don't feel like we're up to it. Today's Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into town on a humble donkey and our lives are forever changed. Today, let's put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Happy Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Amen.